<laughs> you see, your question, I mean, you could go for three days in oh, 14 know. directions. And I, and, yeah, yeah, this is why I'd like to do a series. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, with respect to housing, and you've already sort of touched on this, yeah. but housing, cultivation of food, and consumption. Mm -hmm. I realize you're not a futurist, yeah. but what would a sustainable community in the future look like? I mean, that kind of comes back to where are their inspirations, but... but yeah, it, it, you see, the, 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 what would a sustainable community in the future look like? It's a hugely complicated question because you have to tell me what your starting premises are. Are there six billion people on the planet or two billion people on the planet? Are there nine billion, which seems to be where we're headed? Or are we going to stabilize around seven billion? So if we recognize that the planet is a finite space that only has so much bio capacity, as we, we call it, and then the available biocapacity for humans has to be divided among either two, six, or nine billion people, just to stay, take that array. So that clearly uh, more <clears throat> people could have a much better lifestyle with fewer people than if we have vastly more people sharing a limited and declining resource base. Uh, some would argue, just to, to pursue your question to its limits here, that the sustainable population at a reasonably high material standard of Earth is on the order of one and a half to two billion people. So clearly, again to answer your question, what would sustainability look like? It means either we reduce our populations by 66% or thereabouts, or we reduce our consumption by 60 or 80 percent. And in fact, that's what the science is telling us. If you look at the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, it's an 80 to 90 percent reduction in greenhouse gas emissions in order to stabilize global climate. Our own work on ecological footprint analysis says that those of us in wealthy countries must reduce our footprints to our fair Earth share from in North America an average of nine hectares required per capita down to less than two. Well, that's an 80% reduction in the demands we make on the planet, which translates into an 80% reduction in our material consumption. Well, some are horrified at that prospect, but the reality is we can envisage lifestyles in which that would be a perfectly appropriate a way to live, uh, it would free up a lot of time, we wouldn't have to be scrambling like rats to, to get more and more if we had sufficiency and uh, more and more time to dedicate to personal development, to family, to community, to a whole array of values that we don't even, that we've lost frankly, and then I think we could live quite comfortably on much reduced footprints. Indeed, a very large hundreds of millions or billions of people on earth now live on less than uh, two hectares, but with relatively primitive technology, so they're not very comfortable. We could do much better. My concern is that we will continue with our mythic dedication to growth. We'll, we'll reach the point then where we will have consumed so much of our resource wealth that it will be impossible to plan a soft landing or, or what I call a, a contraction of the economy, a planning down to the level of consumption that could be sustained by the earth. All right. So I think it's important, you can be very pessimistic or very optimistic about these things. But I want to emphasize that pessimism and optimism are nothing but states of mind. They have nothing to do with reality. And unless we actually take the action needed to move us toward a fine future for all, then I think the only other option is we're going to stay on the present tack and undermine ourselves and wind up in global resource wars and other forms of implosion at a societal level. Okay. Um, do, do you, I realize that you feel that I don't want you to speak to mm. it. If you don't oh, housing. Yes, yeah, sir. Um, what's the importance, if any, in experimental building, like rehashing yeah. some of these vernacular or traditional building types, um, is given the population, should we be mm. building up more of these really energy intensive high rises, or should we maybe be looking at some of the options of smaller, more self-sufficient communities? Uh, people often ask what the role of the construction industry, the building sector, is in sustainability. And uh, it's, a, it's a very complicated question, as all of these are. First of all, in North America, it's been written a, a number of times that we have among the most inefficient building stock on the planet. And again, that's a product of having had profligate consumption of cheap, readily available energy. Why insulate the house if you could just install a bigger furnace? It was cheaper to do that. So in some sense, there's a huge gain to be made by becoming more efficient 
in our uh, buildings. By the way, here's an example of where Europe is way ahead of us. We're adopting in North America the LEED standard, which uh, almost every community in this region is jumping onto and holding up as the new green building technology. When in fact, uh, many green or uh, uh, LEED certified gold and platinum buildings make almost no real progress toward being more sustainable, maybe a 20 or 30% at best energy efficiency. In Europe, they've adopted in many instances something called the Passive House Standard, which uh, is a real standard that requires performance from these buildings and post-construction monitoring, and they perform at about one-tenth the level of energy consumption of a typical modern LEED certified building in North America. So they're vastly ahead, and it's low-tech. We tend to go high tech with all the bells and whistles when in fact much of the gains can be made uh, through uh, thermal mass and, and better, uh, be uh, what do you call it, the envelope insulation and, and so on and so forth. So point one, if we need new construction, clearly we could do vastly better than we have done historically, particularly in North America. And we should be adopting at a minimum the kind of standard represented by the passive house uh, buildings in Europe. On the other hand, let's keep in mind that if we're already 20 or 30 percent over the long-term carrying capacity of the planet, building more buildings, even more efficient buildings, is simply adding growth to an already excessive circumstance. So there's no particular virtue in becoming more uh, efficiently unsustainable. That's what new buildings that are more efficient do. That's what new cars that are more efficient do. We just get more efficiently unsustainable. A friend of mine once said, uh, you know, the most uh, sustainable building is the building already standing. And I, I think there's some real truth in that, that we'd have a great deal more to gain by trying to, in a sense, re-inhabit our existing building stock and refurbish it to be 90% more efficient than it was when it was built. And that means we're not adding to the load, we're actually reducing it, which is what is required to become more sustainable. So, again, two answers. Real advantage if we must build new to build at least 90% more energy and, and a great deal more materially efficient. But the real gains come from retrofits of existing stock and uh, they actually reduce the total consumption of, uh, of society. Awesome. And I think you've already spoken to that this one. Given our current trajectory, what are some of the possible outcomes, symptoms for a civilization unwilling to reach out its course? Well, I'm, so what, what are some of the outcomes for our civilization if we maintain the current path? I mean, I think you've almost already answered the question. It, it's fairly clear from the science that almost every one of the major indicators that we look at, for example, in, in the work we do around eco-footprinting, is deteriorating. And is deteriorating at an accelerating pace. Energy consumption, even in the so-called most efficient economies, until very, very recently, with this recent spike in, in prices, energy consumption has continued to rise both uh, per capita and therefore, obviously, in absolute terms, uh, right through this whole period of sustainability talk and efficiency talk and so on and so forth. So we're not learning a lesson. In fact, there's good reasons for this I, I can't get into. But the main point of the matter is the main indicators are that climate is changing, soils are eroding, the forests are deteriorating, biodiversity loss is continuing, and these things are accelerating as the uh, billion, literally billions of people in India and China uh, begin to jump onto the materialist bandwagon that we've enjoyed for the past 150 years or so in the West. There's simply not enough planet to accommodate six billion people living the way we do. So if we do keep on this track, which was your basic question, then I see a period of inke increasing resource scarcity, of increasing price increases, of increasing social unrest as people begin to realize that all of their dreams for the future that have been promised through the growth model are not likely to be realized either here or elsewhere. We're going to see, I think, an increase in international disputes over declining resources. We've already seen the first war over oil. And yeah, just this week, uh, the uh, Bush government has announced the awarding of huge contracts to American and other transnational oil companies to take Iraq's oil. So it turns out that the Iraq war was all about oil after all, as if we didn't know. But the main point is, this is just the, the first shot across the bow of civilization, as it were. And if we maintain this, uh, 
the track. And if we maintain our historic international belligerence, if we fail to see that it is in our collective interest to cooperate to solve this problem, then we'll attempt to solve it the traditional way, which is through arms and uh, conflict. And that means, uh, I think, disaster for the future of civilization. My last question is um, just sort of referring back to what you said before about this idea of sort of optimism and pessimism or mm. sort of states of the mind. Mm -hmm. If you could kind of speak to a large group of people rather than just the individual who on their own being as sustainable mm -hmm. as possible can't be all that effective, but you could kind of um, emphasize or lay out like what needs to change in our mindset. I mean, is it voluntary simplicity or? Well, voluntary simplicity is an example of individual action and not everybody's gonna do it. So people who become voluntarily simplistic is simply create what I call ecological space for other people to consume more and more. So um, I, I recently read a paper, I wish I could cite it to you, but it said, look, if people did all the things they can do at the individual level, quite apart from extreme voluntary simplicity, but all the sorts of things like, you know, or leave your car at home once a week, shower with a friend, that kind of stuff, it might make two or three percent difference in terms of the total throughput in the economy. Clearly, that's not going to happen. So I want to re-emphasize again, we are confronted now with the greatest collective problem in the history of humankind. No individual can solve it on his or her own. And it's almost impossible to imagine all individuals suddenly adopting precisely the same ideal lifestyle and solving the problem that way. People respond to really three things. They respond to rising prices, they respond to coercion, and they respond to conflict and war, a crisis of some kind or another. We're seeing massive changes already in uh, behavior around transportation just because of the rise in price of energy. That's a good thing, not a bad thing. Energy has to increase continuously for the foreseeable future in order to move this uh, revolution uh, forward in terms of behavioral change. The other things that we change uh, if we're forced to. People will not, generally speaking, voluntarily get out of the cars and take transit. But if we were to ration gasoline, for example, which may become necessary in the not too, uh, uh, not too distant future, people will be forced to take transit. Once you force a behavioral change, then values change as well. People who today thump on the dashboard and say, damn it, there's too many people on the road, build more roads, will be saying, damn it, this transit system is overcrowded and lousy, make it better. So we'll see the shift in values, but values shift after behavior has been forced to change through social coercion, the law, in other words. The only other alternative between rising prices, social coercion, because we agree as a culture this is good for us, the only other alternative is to wait for the crisis, the rising sea level or the competition for resources that, that leads to war. So if we really want to get serious about solving this problem, it seems to me that the best thing the individual can do is to become politically engaged, to attempt to, not coerce, but convince their neighbors and friends to become politically engaged, and to begin demanding the sorts of things that our science tells us is necessary to move us through this. Uh, at the present time, we have a disenchanted, disengaged, cynical population who don't have any confidence in our politicians, and so people withdraw from the political process, and they're content to go about their own lives as long as they can afford groceries and beer on the weekend. Well, that's not going to cut it. We need to have a politically engaged, well-informed population insisting that their political leaders show leadership and begin to implement those collective values that are necessary for survival. And at present, we see our leadership primarily directed toward maintaining the status quo for the moneyed elites. Uh, if you look at the Bush administration, it's just chronic where all of the large contracts for just about everything, including the, the oil in, in Iraq, goes to friends of the administration and everybody else uh, be damned. That kind of elitist politics is allowed because of this enchantment of most people with the political process. If every one of our uh, representatives in the House of Commons were getting 15 or 20 or 30 phone calls a day from my rate citizens about the stupidity of Canadian energy policy, water policy, and so on and so forth, there'd be a sea change in government in Ottawa. And since that's not happening, 
uh, politicians play to the demands of in industrial lobbyists. So we see stupid things like the subsidization, subsidi subsidies going to ethanol production, to oil and gas production, and so on and so forth. Quite insane, but it does serve certain limited uh, interests in society. But it's our own damn fault. It's quite true that we get the government we deserve.